here in this series called Elijah, and we're taking a look at one of, I, one of the great leaders in the Bible, one of the great prophets of the Bible, who got to do some incredible miracles that God allowed him to do. And uh, it's just an incredible story of the life of Elijah. So we're looking through his lens at kind of our lives. And we started last Sunday with looking at this process that Elijah went through, that God gave him a word and he came to King Ahab. Um, there, he was coming in the time of Israel where they had kind of had shifted from following God to worshiping another God called Baal. And, um, and as they were worshiping him, then the nation no longer believed in God. And so it's very interesting that the name Elijah actually means my God is Jehovah. So and that sounds really incredible until you realize you're coming at a time in your country where nobody believes in Jehovah. And so it's pretty hard to have that name right then in Israel. And so his word was he had to go to King Ahab, one of the most wicked people that was in Israel. There's only one more wicked person besides him, and that was his wife, who was worse, and um, <laughs> Jezebel. Uh, just the name itself, right? You can kind of tell. And so, uh, so Ahab and Jezebel, and they worshiped Baal, and they weren't good, and they weren't following God. And he said, because of that, they're not going to have rain. So the word of the Lord came to Elijah. He came there, and kind of the first time he came onto the scene was to give them a prophetic word that said, there'll be no more rain in Israel. Imagine what that would do to the economy. Imagine what that would do to your life, you people starving to death and all that. And I think when he first came, they had never heard of him. So they're like, so? <laughs> right? Until it didn't rain. Then all of a sudden it's like, okay, you got our attention. And then from there he went through a process, and we said it was so important, the process that he went through. In fact, we're going to see that today. These messages are stackable. So if you missed it, newbranch.tv is our YouTube site. It's right on the back of your flyer. You can go back and listen, or we got CDs available, not just so you can listen to me, although that would be great, uh, but also so that you can catch up. Because if we don't have the first piece right, and I'll brief you on it so, so you don't feel like, hey, I can just leave if I wasn't here last week. But, but the reason why that's so important is, is Elijah went through this process where he learned to trust in God, but he did so in obscurity. So God used him to come and talk to Ahab, and then he sent him away, and he said, I want you to go hide. And he's like, what? I'm supposed to be the man of God. That means I'm like Moses. I should be up on a stage. I should be up on a platform. No, you go and you hide in obscurity. In fact, you're going to be completely by yourself at this place called Kirith Raven, which means cut off from blessing. And we find that God oftentimes helps people in obscurity or in need or in pain and that he uses that process to help them depend on God. And we were talking last week about saying, hey, sometimes God takes your greatest hurt and that turns into the greatest ministry for you or God uses that over and over and over again. In fact, that's the only way God works. If we look at all the great people in the Bible, the only place that he does that, every great person of God, we said, hey, God never used anybody he hasn't crushed first. And so he crushes him. Why? Not because he's mean, because he wants Elijah to depend on him. And so from there, he, he dries up the brook, and then he goes to this widow lady's house, and God says, I want you to go to her, and she's going to provide the food now. I'm going to dry up Curious Raven, the raven. that He actually had a physical raven that came and brought him food, which I thought was kind of cool. You're not going to be able to do that. You go to her, and you ask her for food. That kind of blows the, the example of saying you can't minister to somebody unless you're up here and all strong and everything, but that sometimes you can minister to people even when you're weak. <laughs> he had no food, and God said, I want you to go and ask her for a meal. And I think he thought, okay, well, she must have lots of food. Well, he gets there, and she's like, I have, the, all I have left is these three pancakes, and they're for me and my son to die with, but I guess I could give you one. <laughs> Well, that's not exactly the accommodations he was expecting. So, but anyway, it is carbs, and so he was pretty happy about that. <laughs> and so, anyway, sorry. And, uh, and so, so he eats the pancake, and then the next day God provides a little bit more, and God provides a little bit more. And so for weeks this goes on, and they're really excited because God's providing pancakes every day, so they're kind of having that sugar high or the, whatever. And then what happens? The boy dies. And the lady goes ballistic, and she's just like, I can't believe that, that God let this happen. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in you. I can't believe that God did this. Anybody ever been there? I've, I've said those words before. And Elijah, because of his time in Kirith, he believes in God. Now, I don't know that he necessarily knew what God would do, but he walks in the room and he prayed. So he goes to God and he's like, this lady's yelling at him and screaming at him and just saying, get out. And he prays. And God raises the boy from the dead, one of the greatest miracles in all the Bible. In fact, up to that point, there was not a greater miracle. And God raises the boy back to life, and he walks in the room with her. And, of course, that lady's faith, she believes in God. But more than that, at that point, he becomes the man of God. In fact, she says that, now I know you're a man of God. Now I know there's a God. Now I know what God says is true. And God taught 
Elijah something in obscurity that he's going to use for what we're going to talk about today. Today is the big moment, but if you haven't had that time in Kiriath, if you haven't had that time of preparation, you won't know what to do with a platform. But today, Elijah is about to get the largest platform imaginable, and that prepared him for it. So if you missed that, go back and hear it. Go back and read it, 1 Kings chapter 17. You don't have to just listen to me. You can actually read it in the Bible. (laughs) And uh, so 1 Kings chapter 17, make sure you get that as the onset, or what we're going to talk about today won't work. There's a lot of people that have big platforms. There's a lot of people that have platforms that they probably shouldn't because they've never been to Kirith. They've never learned from God in that process. And so, okay. So let's talk about where we're going to go today. So here's the principle we want to talk about today. We'll put it up here on the screen. It's this. False gods promise what only the true God provides. That might seem to come out of the blue like, okay, you're talking about the big stage. What does that got to do with anything? Because of what he's going to talk about today. They believed in Baal, and today he's about to show them, you guys are following Baal. Or some of you guys are not even following Baal. What you're doing is you're going, I worship Baal a little bit over here, and I worship Jehovah a little bit over here. Shh, don't tell anybody. And he's going, today it's going to be a decision to say, hey, you got to stop following this false God that isn't providing you anything, but follow the true God who truly can. You want to know why he knew it? You want to know why Elijah knew about this? Because of Kirith. You see, he was able to do this on a public stage because in private God took care of his needs in Kirith. He was able to do this because he had seen God raise somebody from the dead. Now, if you saw God raise somebody from the dead... (laughs) Is there much more that you wouldn't believe? If God told you to do something else, you're more apt to go and do what God said. And so, so important. But, but the biggest thing we want to take away from today is this, is that false gods promise what only the true God can provide. So turn with me, 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18, or in your outlines, or we'll put it up here on the screen. 1 Kings 18 and verse 17. So I need to set this up a little bit. So after his time with this widow lady, And uh, they had a great time. Then God sent them a word and said, now it's time. It's been several years. They haven't had rain. They're ready. And so you're going to go talk to the king of Israel, Ahab. The last time you talked to him, you said it wouldn't rain. Now you're going to go to him and tell him what this is all about. He's got Ahab's attention. i tell you, God knows how to set a stage, doesn't he? I give you a couple years without rain, you're ready to talk. Okay. When when Elijah came the first time, you didn't even want to hear it. Now you're ready, to, you're ready to hear him. And so he sets it up through um, another prophet named Obadiah. Obadiah is during this time too, just a side note. And so he talks to Obadiah, and Obadiah gets Ahab, and they kind of have this meeting. And so here's what happens when he first sees him. So 1 Kings 18, chapter 18, verse 17, it says, When he, this is talking about Ahab, saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? <laughs> I, I want you to circle that, that first part. And, and the reason I want to do that is, is for some of you that have decided to follow Jesus or you've started to cha- make some changes in your life, or you think that people are going to be excited about you telling them the truth, <laughs> um, I'll laugh, I'm laughing with you, uh, <laughs> understand this. This is maybe the response you'll get. That Elijah was following God for real and he got criticized for it. And I just want to point that out because some people, including myself, are kind of shocked sometimes when you go, but I'm doing what God said. I didn't think people would criticize me for that. Um, Can I tell you something? They will. They they do. And if they're not criticizing you, it may be what everybody else in Israel was struggling with. If you really follow God, more than likely, well, not more than likely, you will be criticized. Now, I'll put it different. If you're not being criticized, you're probably not following (laughs) because you're not saying much. You know who's not criticized? People that don't do anything. Now, let me just say from the onset, there's some people that will take that and they'll go, the reason I'm being criticized is because of Jesus. And and we just need to say very lovingly, no, you're being criticized because people don't like you. Okay, (laughs) Don't blame Jesus for, you know, being offensive and being irritating and all that kind of stuff. You got it? So there are people that are very irritating and they use, they hide behind their Christianity and say, no, no, they've rejected Christ. And he's going, no, don't put me in that same category because your message is being delivered in a horrible way. You get the idea? And some, anybody ever seen that? Raise your hand. No, don't, please don't do that. I see that hand. I feel you. Okay. I got you. I've done it too. Okay, we all done it. But, but here's the point. Don't let that stop you to go, hey, some people, okay, if, if you're doing it in the wrong way, stop doing that. But here's the point. If you're being criticized, don't take that as, well, I must be doing something wrong. No, it means people, when they see the truth, don't always like it. Have you ever had that time? And this is what I want to tell you. I know in my life, when, when truth is pointed out to me, it hasn't always been accepted very 
friendly. Is that true? Sometimes even violently. <laughs> that, that the best thing that was ever told to me was somebody told me something I didn't want to hear, and that day I walked out the door and said, you're not my friend, I never want to see you again. You get the idea? But that's your best friend now? You get the picture? So don't think that just because you're being criticized, just because it stirs up conflict, just because it's going to be a problem, just because somebody's not going to like you, just because somebody's not going to come back to church no more because you said something and now it offended them, doesn't mean that it shouldn't be said. And you know how you can have the confidence to do it? You know how you know the difference? is because God sent you to deliver that message. Now, we want to do it the nicest way. We want to do it the best way. But we've got to be very careful to say we want to be unoffensive churches. That's ridiculous. The gospel is an offense. When we share with them on Easter Sunday that you're so bad that Jesus had to die on the cross, that's pretty bad, isn't it? I mean, the day you understand that's what we're actually saying, <laughs> that's offensive. I don't care who you are, right? You're that bad that Jesus had to die like that for you, okay? So it's hard. Well, I'll tell you what takes the edge off a little bit when you say, but I'm that way too. Then it's like, oh, wow, you're one of me. Okay, I got you. All right, so just understand we're going to be criticized. Verse 18, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but... You and your father's family, you have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed Baal. Is that pointed enough? He's not apologizing for something he didn't do. <laughs> He's saying, you're saying the problem is me. You're saying we don't have rain because of me. You don't, you're killing the messenger. But let me tell you something. The reason you don't have rain, the problems that are in your life, isn't me. You don't like it because I pointed them out. That hurt you, didn't it? I poked at it, and now you're mad. But let me tell you what your problem is. You're, you stop following the real Jehovah. You remember, you remember Moses, right, when he said, when you go into the promised land, don't forget the Lord, the God of Israel, who delivered you out of the land of slavery. You remember that? And you've forgotten him, and you started worshiping the gods here, and you forgot Jehovah God. Or, or you, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. You do worship Jehovah God, but you worship Baal more. You're kind of putting them on equal foot, and Baal's a little bit higher for most of you. And I'm telling you, you have abandoned God, you've abandoned his commands, and that's why all this bad stuff is happening to you. Can I say something? Don't be afraid to tell the truth. Now, we've talked about something in this church, and I think it's really important. Now, Andy Stanley was the first one I heard pointed out so clearly. He said, there's a tension between truth and grace, and there really is. There's this tension that can't be resolved. And if you try to resolve it, you'll mess everything up. Because there's this side that says, I have to, I have to be gracious. And sometimes truth will, will take a back seat to that. Does that make sense? That, that I, wanna, I can't tell you the truth because if I did, I might hurt you. But you're going, but the truth will hurt you eventually, right? Have you ever been to all grace church where it's like everything is fine? Don't, you don't have to, you, you know, everybody just will get along and Jesus loves you and you don't need to change your life. And we go, but that's so gracious, right? Because God loves you, and it doesn't matter what you do, and keep doing the bad thing that's going to cause you to have turmoil, right? I mean, imagine your kid. They're walking out on 460. Well, I, I know, but I don't want to hurt your feelings, so just keep on walking. You get the idea? You're like, well, that's not loving, right? I mean, stop, you know? And so eventually you got to figure it out. Now, having said that, there's all truth church, too. You ever been there? <laughs> Where you leave feeling condemned, don't worry, <laughs> where you feel leaving condemned and, and guilty and just guilt and remorse and, and, and you know, you're so bad and there's really not much you can do about it, so you probably should just go away and come back when you're better or something, or maybe you shouldn't come at all. I mean, you're probably not worthy of us, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's true though, right? I've been there and, and that's, that's hurtful. And you go, and can I tell you something about truth? Not all truth needs to be shared. Is that true? Hey, if you don't believe that, gossip is truth. You know, it's compared to the sin of witchcraft because truth in and of itself isn't just the acid test that, hey, is it true? But here's the problem that I see. The pendulum swings back and forth between truth and grace, and you're going to need both. You can't let go of either one. That's right. But the problem with church today, and well, I shouldn't say church because not all churches are like that. The problem with our church, we sometimes swing to the grace side. And we go, I don't want to tell the truth because it kind of hurts a little bit. And that can be dangerous. So here's what I want to say. Don't be afraid to tell the truth. I understand they might be upset. But the truth is, they know that's what's affecting their lives. And to not point it out is not loving. That's how you know. The loving thing to do is to tell this hard truth. Your problem is you're following Baal. You see, the problem is this. You're trusting a false god for what only the true god can provide. It's okay to say that. Oh, that's kind of that's narrow, isn't it? I mean, isn't there more than one god? There's more than one God, but only the true God can provide. You get the picture? There's lots of gods, but only the true God can provide this. So, so here's the question. Who, who is your God? Well, maybe I should say it different. Who or what is your God? You, you want to know how you can tell? Who do you follow? 
When, when you're in crisis, who do you go to? Where do you go? Do you go to God? Do you go to God in prayer? Do you go around God's people? Do you gather people together? Do you come, do you come to a place like this? It doesn't have to be here, but do you have people that you get around when you do that, or do you have a different side? that you go, well, this is good for Sunday. This is good for a side note. This is a good add-on to my life, but my real life is about this. That's your God. Don't, don't fool yourself. There's a great way you can tell who you follow, and that is where you spend your time and where you spend your money. Now, I know some people have angst with it, as I do, just because I've heard a lot in the past where people would use that to try to get money for the church. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, are you following Jesus' commands? Now, this has more to do with just saying, hey, am I saved? Okay, well, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're saved. It's by grace alone. God is God's grace alone. But to become Jesus' follower, it will cost you. See, salvation is free. It costs you nothing. Following Jesus will cost you. And for a true follower, it costs us everything. So my question is, are you following his commands and complying your life to him? See, what's first? What's the center? Where do you go? Is it, you know, and, and you can see, you right? When I'm upset and I struggle, I go to alcohol, right? When I'm upset and I struggle, I go to food. When I'm upset and I struggle, I go to addiction. I go to pornography. I go to, uh, you know, an immoral lifestyle. I go to, you get the idea? That is the God. And let me tell you something today. If we don't point it out, and I know it's kind of hard, and people are going, I don't know if I like that. And it can be good things, too. Sometimes it's sports, right? Nothing wrong with sports. But when it becomes our God, when, when God takes the back seat to anything, let me tell you what happens. You're trusting in the false God, but only the true God can provide what you truly need. And it has to be said, because here's the devastation. You're wondering why life isn't working out. You see, if you tell a lie long enough and well enough... <laughs> I love Dave Ramsey said that about debt, I, I, I know, um, that you need debt to survive. And he goes, why? Maybe he's the first one I ever heard say that. You, you, you're trying to buy all these things to impress people you don't even like, right? I mean, I know, I did it, right? And you're going, I have all this debt to prove it. And why is that? Because debt and FICO and all that has become my God. And he's going, you need to worship, you're worshiping at the wrong altar because only the true God can provide it, not this false God. I tell you, when I did it at food, when I did it at pornography, when I do it at addiction, when we do it at drugs or alcohol or whatever else goes in that blanket, and it could be good things, relationships, whatever else is taking the place or the center of God, it cannot provide what God can, and Elijah is pointing it out. And we got to point it out in our own lives. We're going to tell you something else. We need to help some other people. Now, we want to do it as lovingly as we can, but there's some people who go, I don't want to be judgmental. Okay, well, it's not being judgmental to tell the truth, is it? To say, you are about to walk out on the road and you are trusting in something that's false. Well, we'll just let you do. You know, I believe this way, you believe that way. I'm going to just let you keep going. That's, that's not loving. You get the idea? Eventually, you got to say, how is that working out for you? Oh, by the way, that's what he says. Okay, you ready? So let's keep going. Verse 19. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. That's his wife. I know they're all your friends. Bring them all. Now, a lot of people are afraid of a moment like this. You see, when it gets confrontational and you're talking to the king, and by the way, he could kill you, and he's probably thinking about how he can, and he's planning on it. He's saying, bring all these prophets to one place and bring out everybody, because I want you to see who's real and who's not. That's the whole point. <laughs> Don't be afraid of moments like this. Can I tell you something? Don't be afraid of false gods. Don't be afraid of the false god, Satan. Don't be afraid. Can I tell you how many times the Bible says don't be afraid? 365 times. Can I tell you what Christianity is not? It's not fear-mongering. It isn't passing off guilt, which is one and the same. We're not here to bring guilt. We're here to bring conviction that leads to change. Satan wants to tell you you're trapped. <laughs> he wants to tell you you're not free, and Jesus wants to set people free. You see, don't believe the false God for what only the true God can provide. Don't believe that lie. It's so true. You, you know why he could do this? Because he traded his fear for trust in God. That's the difference. Did he know how God was going to do this? No. But here's what he knew. You, you know why he could do this? This is why last week's message is so important to this process. He believed because he had seen it. Don't get up here and tell people that God's going to do this and claim stuff that he never talked to you about. Don't get up and claim that God is going to do something because here's what you're going to do. You're going to do like Jesus said when he was in front of Satan. And Jesus, Satan said, throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple. And Jesus said, you should not put the Lord your God to the test. 
You know what I mean? Don't put him to the test in the wrong way. That's why when people say, you know, if you pray anything in Jesus' name, it'll be done. That's true, in Jesus' name, which means it's in compliance with him. You know why he had faith? Because God had called him to this moment. And back in Kiriath, he learned God will take care of me. God will do what he said. You know what he learned? In obscurity, he learned that God could raise this child from the dead. You think he didn't remember that this day? Well, you got 400 prophets of Baal, but I've seen God raise somebody from the dead. I think if God says it, I'm okay with that. Okay? And I know all you guys are worshiping the wrong one, but let's see how it works out. So he knew the kind of test that God wanted. He knew how to set the stage for God to say, I want to show you that the name of my God, if you call on it, it'll do this, and your God will not. And I believe that that's true. And it's okay to do that. See, In fact, it should be done because you're helping them see. So what? Verse 20. So Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Verse 21, Elijah went before the people and said, okay, so obviously a big crowd, 400 prophets and more of, from Asherah. <laughs> All these people gathered, more people than are sitting here today are just the prophets, and then a big crowd from Israel came out to go, we want to see the prophet die kind of thing, you know. <laughs> And they weren't prepared for what he asked next, but he puts it out there. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Can I tell you what the people said? But the people said nothing. You see what their problem was? It's called being an indecisive follower. You hadn't decided who you want to follow. You see, on some days, you're following Baal. And on other days, you're following Jehovah. And Elijah just called you out and said, you know what? That's pretty easy for me because my name means my God is Jehovah. Can you guess which side I'm on? Now, I'm here to tell you, which side are you on? Oh, it's a little harder when you've got a thousand prophets of Baal and, and the king sitting there, and Elijah's all by himself standing there going, what's wrong with you people? Do you know who you are? You're the ancestors of Abraham. What's wrong with you? Now, make a decision. And they go, they didn't. I said, I think I see the problem. See? You got one foot with God and one foot in the world. You think that's going to work? Can I tell you what the problem is in our country? One foot with God and one foot in the world. We're a Christian nation. No, we're not. Yes, we are. No, we're not. Get the idea? And he's calling them out and he's saying, make a decision. I, wait a minute, let me not tell you. It's not just a problem in our country. It's a problem in our church. Are you following Jesus or are you following a false God? But let me tell you again that a false God cannot do what the true God can do. And it's time to be all in or all out. I don't think you've heard people say that, but it's true. And you know, that's not just an Old Covenant principle. It's not just an Old Testament principle. He said it in the book of Revelation. Remember, he said, I wish you'd be hot or cold. I wish you'd make a decision. Are you going to follow me or are you not going to follow me? That's putting it out there, isn't it? You know why he can say that? Because maybe, oh, we'll back off a little bit because we just want to kind of try it. We don't want people to, we don't want people to go out the door and, and, and just reject it. No, he's saying, no, it's time. It's time. You've had long enough to decide which one is it. Is it Baal or God? But I'll help you with your decision today because I'll show you who shows up. And it's the same question that I would ask today. If you're going to evangelize somebody, it's the same question I'd ask. How is it working out? How is your guy working out for you? <laughs> You want to write down the prophetic word of Elijah? It's time to quit wavering. And it's time that Christians stop at, at stopping short of going, yeah, I know, that probably works for you. We'll keep going. You know, that alcoholism probably works out for you. I don't want to be judgmental, so you keep on drinking until the day you die. You go ahead and wreck your family. You ever seen that happen? You go ahead and wreck your family with debt and addiction and all that because we don't know a God that could deliver you from it. Or do you? Because if you do, it's time to decide. Is it God or is it Baal? Is it God or is it the false God? And it's time. And this is what will make all the difference in the world. Quit wavering. Not my words, his. If you're mad at it, get mad at, at um, Elijah. Okay, verse 24. <laughs> then you call on the name of your God. You thought I was kidding when I said this, right? <laughs> this is how he lays it out. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And then all the people, then they had something to say. That sounds good, right? You're going to show me proof. 
Yeah, I'm going to show you proof. I'm going to show you proof that your God won't show up and mine will. That only the true God's going to show up today and the false God won't. Okay, so here we go, verse 26. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. See, they they didn't know what quite to do because they're like, we've never actually seen Baal do this. But they actually believe in Baal. (laughs) These prophet guys, they're all in, right? And they're going, okay, well, you laid down the gauntlet. I've never seen Baal do this, but maybe he will. <laughs> and now we got a big crowd, so we kind of have to, or else we look kind of stupid. So, okay. Then, then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. So for three hours, they're calling out to Baal. Baal, answer us, they shouted. You ever seen anybody cry out to Baal? You ever seen somebody cry out to their addiction? You ever seen somebody cry out to that? Please answer us. I need hope. I thought there was hope in this. If only I had this, then life would finally be happy. If I had this, then finally it would fill the gap. But you got that, and then it didn't fill the gap? You know what I'm talking about? And they're calling, and it's sad, right? And they're crying out to bail, and they're trying, and they're dancing, right? I, I was going to do my bail dance, but <laughs> sorry, I'm not going to. It's kind of provocative, Charles. I ain't going to do it right now. Just, it's not really a church thing. Marie's, Marie's seen it, but we're going to, okay, we'll stop right there. Okay. <laughs> and she said, don't, John. <laughs> okay. And they danced around the altar, and, and they made, and first it's kind of funny, and then it's kind of sad, because guess what comes next? You can read about it in another place. It says they cut themselves, and they cry out. Can I tell you what people do when it doesn't work? They start doing irrational things as they worship a God that cannot provide. And Elijah is pointing out something to somebody that is so sad. It sounds so funny, but it is so sad because these people had invested their whole lives in worshiping this false God that can't provide for them. And then Elijah comes at noon, and he began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy. Can I tell you what that means? It actually means doing his business. It means using the bathroom. And he just gets provocative. Or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. Pretty funny, and I like sarcasm, and I like criticism. I'm a very critical person, so anyway, it's funny to me. But, but here's the problem with this. I, I don't want us to send the wrong message today. This is not about us taunting people that don't believe, so don't take that the wrong way. Okay? It's not about us pushing them down. You know why we don't push them down? Because we've all been there, right? You ever cried out to the wrong God? You ever been so desperate that you're holding on to your God? I know. You ever had the God of hate? I have. You ever had the God of lust? You ever had the God of whatever it is, and it's holding on with all its might, and you're screaming out going, I just need, you know, sadness, grief, relationship, whatever it is that you think is God, and it's not providing, and you're cutting yourself, and you're doing everything you can, and this world doesn't make sense anymore? Don't make fun, but here's what I want to tell you. Point out the lie. It's okay to do that. You know that thing you're following? You know what I'm talking about. People that you really know, people that you really love, people you really care about. That thing you're following ain't going to work out too good. I know. I followed it. You know that hate you're holding on to? You think if you can get revenge, but it won't. You know, I had one of the guys I hate so bad, he died a really terrible death. Can I tell you something? And I didn't do it, by the way. (laughs) I just want to be clear. I'm on tape. (laughs) I thought about it. He died horribly, and um, it didn't ever make me feel better. You know that? That you get what you think would make you feel better, and it doesn't. It just makes you want more. That's what the false God does. Salt water, man. I'm telling you. Point out the lie. Now, let me explain what happens next. They go on for a while doing all this stuff, and Elijah goes, I guess your guy's not going to show up. Maybe you need a break. (laughs) Let me show you what mine can do. And he comes out, and he sets up the altar, and he says, no, we're not ready yet. And they're like, what do you mean? He said, I want you to get out some water, and I want you to pour it on it. And then he asks him, I want you to pour some more water on it. I think seven times or something like that, they pour water and drench the altar. He goes, I don't want there to be any doubt today who God is. That's laying down the gauntlet. But let me tell you something. When you have seen God raise somebody from the dead, it's okay to do this. Get it? When God is calling you to it, now you better make sure it's God. You get the picture? Because if it ain't God, you're going to be an idiot and your head's going to be on the spike because you've got a thousand prophets of Baal you just made fun of. <laughs> your God better show up. You know how you know God shows up? Because he showed up for you, right? Don't be sharing your life. Don't be sharing God's going to change your life if he ain't changed your life. You share your experience, strength, and hope, right? I mean, that's what it's all about. And he's about to do that. He's like, I've seen God and he's going to show up. Okay. We're ready for him. 
So what does he do next? Verse 36, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet stepped forward and he prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God. You want to circle that? You are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. This is why Curious was so important. I see platforms being built for men and brands and organizational structures and all kinds of other things. And this is dangerous. Because on the day that you're called forward, you better not let them worship you. And Elijah didn't. Today isn't about Elijah. This is not Elijah's moment. This is God's moment. And he got it because he goes, I can't raise anybody from the dead. When a kid dies, I don't know what to do with that. You know, when Moses came to the Red Sea, I love it how people think that it's the great leader that does the miracle. Did you know Moses had no idea that God was going to part the Red Sea? You read the story. You know what he did? He prayed. And he believed that God would do something. He had no idea that it would be that. It's like, who thought of that, you know? Daniel didn't know that God was going to shut the mouths of the lions. Can I keep going? Joseph didn't know while he was in prison that God is going to do this incredible work. You get the picture? Men of God, women of God, that is not you knowing. It is not about you. And so when you step forward, you're stepping forward with God and you put him at the center of it. And you said, I'm praying that what? That they will know that you are God. By the way, that's praying in Jesus' name, is it not? Because he's saying, I'm only praying what you've already told me to do. Now let me ask you a question. If God told you to do it, you believe? You believe he can? Elijah did. Verse 37, answer me, Lord. Answer me so the people, this is so important, he got the motive right. So that the people will know that you are the Lord, that you, the Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Underline that. You get it? That's the point. The point of the miracle isn't just so God can be cool. I've heard that several times. God just does cool things. Well, God does cool things, but he does them on purpose, with a purpose. And the point of what he wants to do in this world is to bring hearts back to him, even in the Old Testament. You see it? No different today. He does miracles for what purpose? For that. Not our platform, his. And he's going, I know my role here today, and the reason why I've called everybody out is so that you'll stop believing the false God and see the true God. He's going to do this incredible miracle, so you'll follow him. That's that's so important that you get that right, or else it won't make sense. It's all about God. Verse 38, then what happens? Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. Is that clear enough? Can I tell you something about God's miracles? When he shows up, there's no doubt. (laughs) When he transforms something, when he does something, there's no doubt that it's God. So let me explain what happened. He not only burnt up the sacrifice, he didn't catch the sacrifice on fire, he consumed it all, including the water. So nothing was left. It was as if everything's done. I have a feeling they felt that on their face. You get the picture? So here's what I want to say. Expect a miracle. God will do what he says. If he's called you to it, then he will accomplish it. You don't have to look at logic. You don't have to look at other things. But if you know that God has called you, if you don't know God called you to it, you better not be standing on that mountain. You'll be consumed by fire. It's the people that are burning you alive. <laughs> Get it? Don't do it without God. But if God has told you to do it, you better believe he'll show up, whether everybody else is on the other side or not. All right? There's a verse that says it, right? If God be for us, who can be against us? Verse 39 is the apex of what happens here. When the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. Get it? The Lord, he is God. (laughs) That's the point. Can I tell you when it's done right, when ministry is done right, when God is using somebody and it's done correctly, it doesn't bring glory to that person. It brings glory to God. You know what they didn't say? They didn't say, Elijah, he is God. Oh, Elijah, we can't do it without you. Oh, Elijah, you're such a great speaker. Oh, Elijah, you did so many great miracles. No. It wasn't about Elijah. At that point, Elijah became very small, and they went, it's God, because the fire didn't come from Elijah, it came from God. And you know what Elijah's part was? He's the only one, anyone in Israel could have done this. 
You know why it was Elijah? Because he's the only one that believed in God. <laughs> There's a lot of takeaways for today. I want to I want to I want to talk just a minute about that, and then I want to tell you something very practical we could do today if we really believe. Takeaway is this: Who is your God? For somebody here today, it's this. Stop believing the false God for what only the true God can provide. I know we've been pointing it out. I know we've been hurting, but it's time to stop wavering. If it's God, then follow him. If it's not God, then stop following. Stop pretending. Stop putting on your happy face and coming to church and acting like this is God. It isn't. So just be honest with what it is. I follow whatever it is, and let me know how it works. If it's alcohol, then you need to drink the last drop and figure out, is that God? And if it's not, and you go, I can't, I can't give it up, that's the first step, right? Because you can't give up your addiction. You aren't going to muscle through it. You're not going to be the one to do it. You know who does it? It is God who returns you to sanity. It is God who will deliver you. It is God that will be there in the process that helps you. But let me tell you something. You ain't going to do it by yourself. And it's time that you've gone ahead and decided, right? Addiction, same thing. Relationships, same thing. Immorality, same thing. Food, pornography, drugs, you name it sports, whatever you're putting in the wrong slot that God belongs in, your life will change the day you go, you know what, he is God. But if you decide to follow him, let me tell you something, he will show up. Now, you might say, you know, that's Old Testament, that's real nice, John. He don't work that way no more. And I know there's a lot of places, I won't mention denominations, but there's some people that don't believe God can do anything anymore. This ain't just Old Testament. When Jesus came and he died on the cross, let me tell you something, he was right down the street from Mount Carmel. Did you know that? He'd been to Mount Carmel. And when he died on the cross, and he was buried, and he rose from the dead. This sounds a lot like this story, doesn't it? A boy got raised from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead, and then something happened. Remember, I told you about fire coming out, and you go, what is that about? When Jesus ascended back into heaven, and he said, all right, I've paid for the sins of the world, and I want you to spread the gospel. Can I, can I tell you what the Great Commission is? I think some of us have forgotten. To spread the gospel to every living creature. That's our mission as a church. That's, what we, that's, what we're, that's the purpose of the church, is to share while there's still time. That's our only purpose. Amen. That is our God-given purpose. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we believe that, right? But sometimes we forget. And then he said, I want you to go and wait. And they went and they waited in an upper room. And on that day the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. And you know what it says it was like? It was like tongues of fire came on them. And the, and the prophecy was fulfilled that Jesus said, I will not baptize with water, I will baptize with fire. Did you get the picture here? Fire came out of heaven and entered them, and the power of the Holy Spirit helped the church leap onto the scene to fulfill its God-given purpose, which is to reach the lost while there's still time. Now, let me ask you a question. you believe that's still true? You believe that's still our mission? <laughs> then do you believe if we follow God that he would actually accomplish that right here? I do. So the first thing is this. How about you? Do you know him? <laughs> Which God are you following? Maybe you've got some gods you've got to lay down. I get it. Okay? If you need help with that, you come see us. The second thing is this. Who do you know that needs it? Let me tell you something. If it's true for Elijah, it's true for me. If it's true for me, it's true for you. If God could do it for Elijah, he can do it for us. If God did it for me, he can do it for you. I want to take it one step further. If God could do it for you, he can do it for somebody else. Now, here's a statistic. I'm not all about statistics, but this guy is pretty smart, Dr. Thomas Rayner. He's a church planting specialist, and he said this. 82% of people that are unchurched are at least somewhat likely to attend church if invited. And we found that to be pretty true. That the stat is this, 82% of people that come to church, 82% of people that come to church and receive Christ as their Savior and become a follower of Christ, 82% of them, you know why they came? Somebody invited them. You know, let me tell you why they didn't come, and we've looked at those stats too, and they're pretty true. They didn't come because the pastor was awesome. Like 2% came because the pastor was awesome. Now, that might be a little higher here because you got... No. <laughs> nah. You got an okay pastor, so we can still have people come, okay? You got it. It wasn't because of the music program. It wasn't because of the kids thing. It wasn't because of anything else. It was because somebody cared enough to invite them, and they said they would come. And you know what? I think it's true. You know when they didn't come? When nobody invited them. So I don't, I don't want to push too hard, but here's what I want to say. We still got a little bit of time left. We got 10 minutes left in the service, and we can take more time than that if we need it. But here's how we're going to end today. If you need prayer, you come find one of us after the service. 
But, but here's what I want you to do. Inside your, inside your outlines are seven cards like this, postcards. And we've asked everybody this week to bring in seven addresses. We say, you're really serious. We're going to invite people to Easter this year. 82% of them said they'd come if we invite them, so we're going to put this to the test, okay? We don't really believe that. We believe one out of seven. Because, <laughs> dude, if seven people come, 100 people invite them, <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> but we're believing God, and we'll pack them in. If they come, we'll put them out, and, and you guys get up, and they'll all come in, and we'll get the idea. I don't care, but here's the point. I want to ask you a question. you know anybody that needs the true God? And if you believe this church is life-given, then are you willing to invite them? If you're not, then let's not lie about what that is. We don't believe. We still got one foot with the world and one foot with God. We still got one foot going, yeah, I know who God is, but I don't want to tell anybody. I don't want to get involved. I don't want to be offensive. But let me tell you what it means when we say that. Do you know somebody that eternity hangs in the balance to say, hey, on Easter Sunday, fire could come out of heaven and it would inflate them. Not John, not a, pleach, not, not, a, not a bigger platform for John, not a bigger influence for New Branch, but, but one thing and one thing alone. Do you know somebody needs the gospel of Christ? We're going to preach it that Sunday. I hope that you're praying. But here's what we've done, just so you know, when you send these out. I thought we should start with prayer. We did, right? First of the year, you know why we did 21 days of fasting and prayer? This right here. It is. Maybe you didn't know that, but that's what this was all about. I knew it. I went, before we do this, this is what it's got to be. You know why we've been praying all the way up till now? You know how we started with saying, hey, the last series, please pray, please pray. Don't start inviting. Please pray, because we understood nothing about this is going to get them here. It's not a gimmick. You know what it is? When this goes from us, it's from the power of God, and we go, well, how do we know God's going to do this? Because the stated purpose of the church is to, is to reach the lost while there's still time. So... So do you believe God will send the fire? Oh, wait a minute. Can he raise somebody from the dead? And here's how I'd say to invite him. Did he do it to you? Because I know what he did to me. It was as if he took a dead person and he raised him back to life. Right? And I believe if he could do it for me, he can do it for them. Some of you guys are struggling, and I know, I know part of the problem here is this. Your life doesn't add up. <laughs> so it's a little bit hard to invite somebody when you're going, my life isn't completely right. So maybe I need to wait for that. Can I do you a favor? It never will be if you're waiting for that. So here's what I want to tell you. Go ahead and invite them and be honest on the card, okay? When you write, this is just a sample letter. Some people were actually using that. You don't have to write this, <laughs> but just told you where the address goes because I know some of us, like me, is dyslexic and I might get it mixed up. No. Write them a real note. Don't lie to them, man. You know how many people can't stand hypocrites in the church? Just tell them, you know what? I'm struggling. I'm going to this church. I'm starting to get my life straight. Come do it with me. You know what? I struggle with alcoholism. I need to, I'm getting help for it. I believe God can deliver me, and he can deliver you too because you've got the same problem, and we're going to do it together. You get the picture? And when that happens, I believe this. When we're truly honest with where God is, fire will come out of heaven Amen. and enter people's lives, and hate will come out of them. You get the idea? And the Holy Spirit will come in. Alcoholism will come out of them, and the Holy Spirit will come in. Drug addiction will come out of them, and the Holy Spirit will come in. But more than that, they'll be saved and have the joy of God and the in, what the true God can provide, these false gods can't. And they will lay them down and follow him. That's why this is so important. So seven cards you got in there. Can you invite seven people? You go, I didn't bring any addresses. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I know, I'm, I'm putting it out here today. We're going to mail them. There's a thing in the back today. You can drop them off. And I know some people had to take them home. I get it. But I really want you to push right now because here's what's going to happen. You can fill them out now or you can have Satan attack you later. And what he'll do is, is, yeah, that's just not that important. You, right now, in this moment, you're going to do it. And when you walk out those doors, you're going to go, yeah, it ain't that important. Let me say something. Somebody's soul ain't that important. I'm just going to be honest with what I see. Are you really following? Because you don't believe much, do you? You really don't believe this is life-giving. I struggle with that. So please, I know I'm putting it on you, but I'm doing it because I truly believe there's somebody that's going to get this card, and they're going to go, somebody cared enough to send it. You know why I think that? because that's what happened to me. All right, let me pray for you, and then when you're done doing it, or let's say you're new and you go, you guys are nuts, <laughs> please come back another Sunday. We don't do this all the time, <laughs> so please don't feel that way. Come by and see us. I mean, I understand if you're new and you go, I don't even know if I like this church. Okay, I understand. Don't invite anybody. So let me pray for you guys. We love you, and I care about you, and I so much thank you guys for participating. So let me pray. Father God, we come before you today, and when these moments, Lord, I just pray this. I pray somebody's faith will be increased. I pray, Lord, that, that somebody's name will come to mind, that even the, the, the biggest skeptic is saying, you know what, I don't know, this is, I don't know if I'm going to do that. 
But, but I pray, Lord, right now, you'll bring somebody to their mind that goes, you know what, they need this. You know what, a note from me, a personal note from me might make all the difference. You know what, they might not even come to this church, but you know what, they might come somewhere or they might see somebody cares about them the same thing you did for me. I believe this, God. If you could do it for Elijah, you can do it for us. I believe, God, if you can do it for John Hunter, who is nothing, <laughs> who should have never been on a platform, I can tell you that. But here I am. I pray, Lord, you give this church a platform. And when I say this church, I don't mean New Branch. I mean Jesus Christ. Because he is the true God. And I pray on Easter Sunday, when they come, they don't go, oh, man, John was so awesome. I pray they don't say, hey, all these other things were awesome. I pray we are awesome. But I pray this more than anything. I pray they leave here going, the Lord, he is God. And when that day occurs, Lord, they will go from being dead to finally being alive. And that's our prayer, Lord. That's what we're offering. And so we pray you go out before us. And we're believing you for it because we're praying in your name because it was your mission anyway. You receive all the honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.